Hello everyone, and welcome to the next edition of the Holland Land Office Museum's Artifact Video Series. My name is Ryan Duffy, and I'm the director of the museum. And this week we're going to talk about a piece of presidential history that we actually have here at the museum. We're actually going to talk about uh, a uh, somewhat lesser known president, but one with direct connections here to Western New York, particularly the city of Buffalo, and that is Millard Fillmore. And actually in our collection behind me here, we have a table and set of chairs that actually came from President Millard Fillmore's home in East Aurora. Um, now, Mr. Fillmore grew up in the Finger Lakes region, but eventually uh, came to Buffalo where he made his fame and fortune, and it is where he rose to the presidency. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Millard Fillmore, our 13th president, and uh, the particular artifact that we have here connected to his life. Now, Millard Fillmore was born on January 7th in 1800, and he was born in the little town of Morovia in Cayuga County in the Finger Lakes region. Uh, but his family moved around several times, uh, eventually settling in East Aurora. Now, as a young man, uh, Millard received very little formal education before finally receiving some uh, when he was about 15, which is actually where he met his wife, Abigail, who was a student and a classmate of his. Um, now, with his brief stint in education, uh, this gave him enough clarity to pursue uh, more uh, thoughtful careers than just working in simple industry, uh, particularly cloth making. He eventually began to study law and by 1823 was admitted to the New York State Bar. By this time, uh, his family had moved to East Aurora and he was spending a lot more time in Buffalo, though he didn't keep a law practice in Buffalo as he felt it was more prudent and more independent to be the only lawyer in the small village of East Aurora. With his growth as a lawyer, he became more interested in the political field and actually became uh, heavily connected with the Anti-Masonic Party, which has a lot of its beginnings right here in Batavia with the William Morgan incident uh, a few years before. And he became closely connected with the head of that movement, Thurlow Lee. And he attended several of those con uh, conventions and eventually became a prized commodity by Weed and someone he wanted to put into political office. He would actually run successfully three times uh, for one-year terms in New York State Assembly from 1829 to 1831 and would have been responsible for introducing several important bills that helped out Buffalo and Western New York. Uh, at this time he became a more uh, prominent person in Buffalo's uh, growth and actually was one of those responsible for writing the city charter when uh, Buffalo graduated from a village to a city. He also helped found the Buffalo High School Association and was uh, a commanding officer in a local militia unit. Fillmore would then go on to serve four terms as a member of the House of Representatives representing the 32nd District of New York, uh, which was the area of Western New York today. Uh, he was rather prominent in, in the House and was responsible for passing a tariff in 1842, which helped uh, the U.S. economy bounce back somewhat. During his time in the House, Fillmore would take up some rather important leadership positions, including being the chairman of the um, Ways and Means Committee, very important committee, responsible for distributing a lot of money. Uh, but he was still locked in in the New York State politics and was actually uh, considered for a New York State gubernatorial candidate uh, coming up to the 1844 election, uh, but was passed aside for other uh, Whig uh, counterparts who Weed also supported, uh, including William Seward, and eventually was uh, elected to New York State Controller, which made perfect sense with his uh, history as the Ways and Means uh, Chairman. And this would put him into rather larger political spotlight, and with the coming of the 18. 48 election, he would be thrust into the national spotlight as he became a leading candidate for uh, the Whig Party uh, presidential nomination. However, this would, he would be cast aside somewhat in the middle of the process and eventually Zachary Taylor would become the nominee, but Fillmore uh, would be thrust into the vice presidential nominee to support Taylor. Uh, originally, he wanted to be the governor of New York, uh, but eventually was put into another position uh, as vice president. Now, Taylor wins the election of 1848, so Millard Fillmore becomes the 
12th Vice President of the United States. Now, uh, his time as the Vice President, which meant he was in charge of the Senate in terms of hearing over deliberations, was very important, and he actually presided over some of the most tumultuous uh, arguments uh, in our nation's history. And this particularly comprised around the what becomes known as the Compromise of 1850, which was attempting to settle the issue of the extension of slavery into the American West with the admission of California as a free state, and also to develop a solid boundary for uh, Texas. Now, part of that compromise revolved around the Fugitive Slave Act, which reluctantly Miller Fillmore supported as a way of a compromise, uh, which has left a indelible stain on his uh, career and his legacy, as it is seen, especially him being from the North and sort of a traitorous act. But in his mind, it was done to help preserve the Union, which was really his main goal. Now, Fillmore's uh, political rise continues as, uh, in 1850, uh, Taylor, President Taylor actually dies uh, rather suddenly. And now Miller Fillmore is the president and actually takes the oath of office in the Senate chambers. Now, his time in office can be seen as, as often lackluster uh, as he pushes through the uh, eventual compromise of 1850 and the Fugitive Slave Act and does not a whole lot else. And a lot of this can be attributed to the resignation of Taylor's entire cabinet before Fillmore takes office, which kind of left him hamstrung a little bit and had to quickly put in his own people. And as a result, he did not receive the Whig nomination again to run again in 1852 and was passed over for that. And came back to Buffalo and continued his law career and also helped found the University of Buffalo uh, in 1847 and remained on as the uh, chairman of the university until his death in 1874. Now, after uh, a few years out of the spotlight, he came back in with the Nationalist or Know Nothing Party in 1856 and was actually their presidential nominee, though he finished a distant third in the voting and actually only won one state. Uh, so after that, he essentially stepped aside from uh, the national political scene, though he would still uh, have some weight in terms of his opinion. With the outbreak of the Civil War, uh, Fillmore mostly supported President Lincoln's policies uh, as he felt that the preservation of the Union was the, the uh, prominent goal, and if it had to be done by force, then that is what had to be done. However, he took a turn in 1864 and actually supported the Democratic candidate, uh, George McClellan. Uh, and during the Civil War, he actually was the commanding officer of a local militia unit, which was a mostly older uh, gentleman in order to protect Buffalo. Um, after his marriage to his second wife, he was able to accumulate enough wealth that he was able to sell the old home in East Aurora and move permanently to Buffalo on Niagara Square, where he would live the rest of his life. Uh, and his second marriage occurred after his first wife, Abigail, died, and his uh, youngest daughter passed away as well, within a few years of each other. Uh, now, Miller Fillmore would actually die in 1874, uh, but his legacy has is more well-preserved locally than nationally. Um, University of Buffalo, he's still very much memorialized for his attempt, uh, efforts to grow the university and from its founding. Uh, there's also a hospital in Buffalo named after him. There's a statue of him in front of City Hall. So his name is well regarded. He's actually buried at Forest Lawn Cemetery uh, with full honors. And his uh, family home in East Aurora is now a, a museum, uh, honor to him, which is actually where this uh, table came from and his birthplace in Rovia is recognized. So I think over time he gets more of a bad rep maybe than he deserves, but he was definitely not one of our most robust presidents uh, and was, not, was often looked over for others in terms of political office, but still had a major impact on Buffalo and by extension Western New York. So now I'd just like to talk a little bit about the actual artifact that I mentioned, which is his parlor table and set of chairs. We actually have a set of six chairs that went on the table, but we only have two on display of the table. Now the table is of mahogany, so very fine wood with a 
very nice veneer over it. And this would have been in his home probably from the 1840s until the 1850s. Uh, from the records we have, it was actually bought at auction. Uh, that's why we assume probably from his first home in East Aurora around 1853. Uh, it was actually uh, bought by the Judd family. And it was actually bought by another U.S. Congressman, Barbara Conable, from the Judd family auction. And eventually it was donated here to the museum. So though it may not have a direct connection to Genesee County, Miller Fillmore's impact definitely affected Western New York and Genesee County by extension. Well, I hope you enjoyed this edition of the Holland Land Office Museum's Artifact Video Series. Uh, in case you've missed any of our previous videos, uh, you can go check them out on our YouTube channel, Holland Land Office Museum. And we actually have a whole playlist of our Artifact Video Series, so be sure to go check them out. I think we're now up to 80 videos, so it's a rather robust collection now. Uh, and if you'd like, please uh, like and subscribe. Uh, like any videos, subscribe to the channel as it uh, gets you ever notified sooner uh, when we do release new videos and get you more in tune with our content. But as always, the best way to come and learn more about our collection is to visit the museum for yourself. Uh, and we'll be happy to share even more stories than what are shown here in the videos.